In the light of hissing torches, the tableaus stretched before them. The forest, clogged with Aquilonian corpses, sprawled and fallen, bent and huddled, all with arrows transfixing their bodies. Yeah, that's just the kind of visceral imagery I need in the morning. Thanks, book. In the center of the wide and turbulent Shirky River rested the Isle of Os Harku, a bleak, wild land inhabited entirely by criminals. Os Harku, often called simply the Isle by the Outer World, was the dumping ground of Aquilonia's worst offenders, murderers, traitors, Conspirators and more were placed on the isle, the waters of the Shirky River their prison bars, and the forces of nature their warden. It is on this island, in a hidden chamber underneath a waterfall cliff, one that resembled a skull, that our story begins. Here, crawling around in the dark, the sorcerer Athu bargains with the demonic entity, Erdru. This spirit, this thing, had been sleeping for countless ages. So long, in fact, that even ancient empires like Atlantis are new names to it. To Arthu, this Erdru makes a simple offer. The sorcerer will gain great power and vengeance in exchange for his soul and the blood of sacrifices to come. Sometime later, elsewhere on the isle, a large man, a veneer named Erdus, surrounded by his underlings as well as his lover, Aleel, is musing about his lot in life and dreaming of escape, of revenge, when he and his tribe are approached by the sorcerer Athu. Athu claims that he is working magic to conjure a storm, and that in only a few days' time, this same storm will force a boat ashore, allowing Erdus and his men a means of escape. Erdus is skeptical, as one tends to be when dealing with sorcerers. Why would Athu help him? After all, only days prior, Erdus had beaten the man for offending his lover. But he also thinks of the possibilities. What if the storm does come? What if the ship does crash? What if indeed? Red Sonia is awoken from her sleep by a terrible nightmare. Or, more accurately, a distant traumatic memory. The Hyrcanian warrior finds herself the passenger of an Aquilonian vessel, the Neros, which is currently traveling down the Shirky River. Sonia rarely enjoyed the finer things in life, and rarer still found herself relaxing on a pleasure cruise downstream. Yet, here she was, enjoying fine breakfasts, a comfortable bed, and the pleasant company of others on the voyage. Such company included the captain of the ship, Tio, as well as Lord Desmos, a man of Aquilonian nobility and an enforcer of laws. Sonia and Desmos converse often enough and, when the Isle of Os Harku appears in the distance, he confesses to her a private guilt that he had sentenced his own criminal brother to life on that same prison island. No sooner had the isle come into view when a dreadful storm manifested, seemingly out of nowhere. The crew of the Neros are unable to gain full control of their ship, and they are run aground, not on the safety of Aquilonian shores, but upon the isle with its many criminals eager to take the vessel. Sonia and the crew mount a defense of the Neros, meeting the brigands with blade and cutting many of them down. It is 
During this fight, when we first see Desmos' apprehension as he recoils from the battle when so many others lay down their lives. Despite the skill and power of Sonya and the others, they are fighting a losing battle, and they are forced to abandon ship, swimming away to the relative safety of escape boats. As they make their way away from the Neros, Sonya could spy something occurring on deck. Another band of brigands was attacking the group that had conquered the ship, and this group had a sorcerer in their midst. Once the battle is done and Erdis's men had taken full control of the ship, the Venier sets about repairing the damage done to the Neros so far, as well as having his men clear away the corpses from the vessel. To the surprise of everyone, however, this greatly upsets the sorcerer who wanted those bodies for his own purpose. Arthur went from corpse to corpse, those that remained at least, and collected from them something. A pale crimson glow emanated from the bodies, being pulled forth from them and into a small box the sorcerer carried. For some time he went about his work, though was soon satisfied, and with the sorcerer's efforts done, the rest of the men could finally prepare to set sail. Sonia and her companions were soon rescued and brought to a nearby Aquilonian fort, where they divulged what they knew to the garrison captain, a man named Hubarthus, and, after a bit of rest, acquiring new provisions and a serious heart-to-heart -heart with Desmos, who was still upset over the whole ordeal, Sonia and the others, Desmos included, went along with Hubarthus's men to retake the Neros with a new vessel. Unfortunately, victory was not to be theirs. No sooner had the Neros come into view when the renegades that commandeered it turned the ship around, ramming into Hubarthus's vessel and climbing aboard. As the Neros sank beneath the river, Erdus and his underlings fought a vicious battle against the Aquilonians. A battle turned in the criminal's favor as Athu's magic worked itself against the men, and even Sonia found herself unable to cut Erdus down, protected as he was. Sonia, Hubarthus, Tio, and Desmos, among a few others, are taken captive by the brutes. Yet, not all is lost. The ship they were on had sustained far too much damage and had to drop anchor near the first friendly beach it could. And while Erdus initially thought that they had landed on Aquilonian shores, in truth, their battle had taken them in one large circle, back to the prison isle. In truth, Athu had no intention of assisting Erdus in his escape. In fact, the sorcerer plotted, at first secretly and now openly, to kill the man by his own hand. Erdus had, after all, pummeled Athu savagely just a few days prior, before the sorcerer had made his pact, and Athu intended to exact vengeance. It doesn't take very long for Sonia and her fellow captives to be freed. More Aquilonian soldiers arrive and get them out of their bonds, though by this point the sorcerer's plot is already complete. Arthu has constructed a large monster from clay, known as an Othalus, and has fueled this creature with the blood of the dead. The final key to this monster's power was consciousness, and Erdus, unwittingly, would provide it. The savage confronted Athu above the same waterfall that the sorcerer had made his pact, and struck him down. However, this act, Athu's death, was the final piece of his plan. As the Shemite's blood flowed, 
His soul, his mind, his will, all entered into the Othalus, giving power and purpose to the towering monster. Athu, now in the body of a great, nigh-unstoppable beast, slays Erdus at last, before turning his attention to Sonia and the others. This Othalus appeared to be all but unbeatable. Swords were harmless against it, and fire did not burn it. Eventually, after some planning, Sonia and others were able to trip this monster, pushing it into a pool of water where it, crafted as it was by clay, dissolved and melted away. The story ends in a tavern with Desmos and Sonia saying their goodbyes, the warrior accepting a hefty sum of gold for her assistance in this matter before departing, riding her new horse into the horizon. In my opinion, When Hell Laughs is probably the least impressive of the six Red Sonia novels with not much going on in it that really stands out amongst its peers. There's a main plot, the machinations of the sorcerer Athu, as well as two subplots centered around Aleel's fascination with the man, as well as Desmos's conflict with his own cowardice and, eventually, his criminal brother. All three of these plots weave together well into the overall narrative, but it just isn't all that impressive. The book is still good, make no mistake, it's well written, the characters are fine, and I greatly enjoyed my first read, but of the novels, this one felt the weakest and is perhaps the only one I wouldn't recommend as a standalone story. There's an awful lot of dialogue that seems needless at times, made worse by the fact that the book, overall, feels shorter than the other installments. That's not to say that there aren't things I like. Once again, Smith and Tierney are masters of world building, and this book shows it off well with how we learn histories and about other individuals of note from the perspective of the characters. There's no boring info dump at any point. Things of interest are mentioned and left at that. I feel that this kind of lets the reader fill in the blanks on a lot of subjects. What caused the Isle of Os Harku to break off from the mainland? Where does Erdru go after this story? Who was she her the demoness, and how did she earn that name? These questions aren't answered, and they leave a lot to the imagination. One last thing before I go, I was kind of annoyed that Erdru and Erdus were two characters that existed in the same story. Come on guys, that just felt like lazy writing. Well, that's really all I've got for this one. Overall, I'd give When Hell Laughs a 3 out of 5. It's fine, but it's definitely not my favorite. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, then please leave a like or share this video with a friend. If you subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell, you'll be alerted whenever I upload new videos. Finally, if you want to support me directly, head on over to Patreon. Patrons keep the channel alive with as little as $1 a month, and in turn, get early access to my lore videos. Thanks again for watching, and have a great day.